Let's talk about the TTY layer, because the TTY layer is a pain point for embedded. Uh, infamously, Nicholas Petrie, uh, in 2015, sent out a patches to rewrite the TTY layer, to strip it down, make it tinier, because he was worried about Linux not working in tiny devices. Turned out it didn't really work well, and I'll go into a little bit why, but um, if you're an embedded device, you use, you sh and especially if you're a real-time device, TTY layer is a pain. It's really, really bad. Um, but there's a great talk, or a great paper, or website, uh, describing the user space side of TTY, where it came from. It's really based in the 1800s, um, the whole idea of a, ter a terminal or a ticker stream, and the history involved, and where it came from, and how the job controls work. And it's crazy. The TTY layer is really insane. Lots and lots of legacy. Um, Again, 1800s. Um, but that talks about the user space side. Let's talk about the kernel side. So Thomas Gleixner um, said, maybe about three or four months ago at a real-time conference, um, the TTY layer is the biggest pain point for real-time. Good luck ever fixing it. Uh, there's a whole talk about why, or article in Linux Weekly News that's public about why, goes into the issue. So I was like, aha, Thomas, you're wrong. Um, let's, I'll, let's, I'll show you how you can fix the TTY layer. Um, spoiler, I failed. <laughs> Um, but this is the thing that people don't realize. TTY layer and serial ports is why all of us are here today. Linux succeeded because we have a TTY layer that works. Linux got successful with ISPs, with serial ports, with modems, and all that stuff. People brought it in the back door, it solved a real problem, and it worked. Many, many operating systems can't even handle serial ports at a ra rapid speed. Heard famously couldn't go over 9600 baht. Um, TTY layer proves that microkernels is a bad idea. Um, it's proof, real world proof. <laughs> um, but because of that, and because of the great work that Linus and Ted and Alan Cox and others have done and to make this crazy, complex, uh, infinitely flexible infrastructure, Linux succeeded. And we got to do Linux and make it go into other things, and really cool stuff. But the basis of it is still there. This is some of the original code in the 1.0 days is still alive in the TTY layer today. Um, it's crazy, but it works. And let's try and explain it a little bit. But this crazy and complexity, I'd like to say, this is why we're here. So we all complain about it, but it's still good stuff. So there's different things. There's a TTY layer, which is, I'll talk briefly about it. Then there's something called line disciplines, which can, talks about the data that goes across that line. And then there's the thing, I'll call, just call them serial ports. There's lots of types of serial ports, but just think of it as a UART, a chip that's going to spend out se serial data out the other end, receive serial port. Serial ports can be like fake ones. They can be um, USB devices, which have another UART on the other end of that, or a fake USB device on that. They can be network devices. You can do all sorts of things, but I'll just talk about it as a serial port, because that's what we're used to in the embedded world. And serial ports have been around for a very long time. My very first paid job out of university in 1992, was working on a serial port for a PC um, and a 286 processor and embedded devices. I'm still getting paid to work on serial ports today. Uh, they're not going away. My entry point into Linux itself was to write the USB to serial layer and drivers. So I've been doing serial ports for a very, very long time, um, and they're not going away despite what everybody thinks. Uh, Microsoft tried to get them to go away with USB. It didn't really work, and there's some problems with that, but we still have serial ports today, as you guys know on all your devices. Um, and we're going to ignore consoles. Um, in the, especially even in the embedded world, consoles are kind of magic. They are a serial port, and they are a TTY, and they're attached to a line discipline. Um, and you kind of want to get some data out of them to look at the line. Just don't worry about them. If you write a serial port driver, you get the console work almost for free. So it's just, I'll ignore them for now, but there's a lot of complexity involved in there. And that's part of why this TTY layer is crazy. But anyway, and, oh, and please interrupt, ask questions. Otherwise, it's, it's more fun for me. Uh, TTY, it's a char device, character device from user space. You open it, you read and write. You can assign a line discipline, which talks the protocol you're going to talk across this stuff. And you do ioctals. You can set the baud rate, you can set the line settings, you can, for a normal serial port, you can do all those types of things. You can do all sorts of other crazy things, talk about echoes. Um, fake flow control, real flow control, change the flow control characters, all sorts of stuff. But from user space, open a character device, read, write, ioctal, close. Simple, easy. There's a TTY layer that handles this stuff. Then there's the line disciplines. And line disciplines is the protocol. 
Linux today has at least 20. I think there's a few more tucked away in different spots. Uh, the normal one is called NTTY for normal TTY. This is what we all think of for a normal serial port or for almost for a console. We want to log in, do something. But then there's pseudo consoles. Um, that's are weird. And there's virtual consoles. And there's GPS, slip network protocols, CAN, the CAN bus has a protocol for this type of stuff, ham radios, PPP. The, really, there's a video phone modem control <laughs> buried in the kernel for this, for line discipline. Works really well. There's also a cool, we buried it in raw, um, Rob Herring did this work, to make an internal serial port connection. Because it turns out the kernel, some driver subsystems want to talk to other driver subsystems through the internal serial port. Well, we made a line discipline, we hook up the two ends, and we can talk directly with, through the kernel that way. It's a really nice hack, works really well. Lots of people, more and more people are starting to use it. Um, and it works on any TTY device. So any serial port, any device, any user space TTY device. There's hundreds of different names and whatnot. They work for anything. So line disciplines are a pluggable infrastructure type of that. protocols. Think of it as a networking protocol. But they do cool stuff. Um, GPS um, does some really weird stuff. But anyway, they're in the kernel. And then the serial port driver. So think about this is like your UART, your old 8250s. <laughs> the 8250 driver, we're still, you think, I mean, it's a free Verilog somewhere, right? People are still making new UARTs. I just, we just got a new UART um, driver sent to us for the ESP32, I don't know, some weird stuff. Samsung made a new US UART. Every hardware company wants to make a new UART. Please stop making new UARTs. This is really, really old stuff. This should be well known. Again, 40 years, 50 years, these have been around. Just use the traditional one and go. But the 8250, it can do DMA now, it can do bit banging, it can do everything. We have support for it all. It's a complex little beast. Um, if you want to write a new one, I don't know why you would want to do that. Just use the driver we have and go. It's not, it's like, what, 60K? <laughs> the UARTs are not tiny. Um, I use the UART driver as a unit of reference in the kernel. Because people say, oh, they're adding new bloat to the kernel, all oh, this new subsystem and whatnot. I'm like, ah, that's like half of a serial port driver. <laughs> and they're like, oh, so it's a good use of reference. So 60K for your UART driver. Um, hence Nicholas's idea to make it slim down and tinier. Turns out he still needed that 60K to talk to the UART. <laughs> um, it's complex. We can pare it down some more, and I'll talk about how to fix that later. But anyway, there's tons of them. ISDN is still alive and well. Uh, the German railway network uses it um, in real devices. So we keep trying to strip US ISDN out of the sub kernel, but no, there's an active maintainer, and it works. Somebody the other day asked me, how many people do we need to keep a driver in the kernel? One. One driver, one maintainer, or one device. Um, that one happens to be the German railway network. <laughs> um, but it works pretty well. And there's about 40 different serial port drivers. And then, there is a serial port, a serial port layer, which has a tons of UARTs hanging off of that. So it's a complex thing. USB serial subsystem. I think we have about 15, 20 different chips in that as well. Some are real UARTs, some are fake UARTs, some are bit banging over USB, some are complex beasts. So these are all these fade out and fade out and fade out. You don't really know how many real drivers are out there. There's a lot, but just for the serial, TTY part, at least 40. Add another 50 or 60 per subsystem, and it gets big. There's a lot. Linux supports everything, which is awesome. And here's a cool hack. Um, a lot of people don't know about this. You want a good example of how to write a TTY driver in a nice, simple way, serial port driver. It's not a real serial port. It's just printk. So you open this character device up. You write characters to it, and it shows up in your kernel log. It's actually really good for debugging. It's really, really handy for early boot. Uh, really good for USB or for um, device spring up and stuff. I don't know why more people don't use this. It's also a great reference. It's 200 lines of code, really well commented, very simple. Please look at this stuff. It's a great hack. I like seeing this stuff. Uh, more people should copy this stuff. Um, and it shows that you can, the TTY layer is very big and complex and onerous, but you don't have to really know it to write a driver to work for it. Again, example like that. The old Linux device drivers book, third edition, um, has a chapter on how to write a TTY driver and how to write a serial port driver. Uh, that's pretty much remained the same, and it's not that complex um, to write a working one, despite how complex the core is. Anyway, cool subsystem, a cool driver. So now let's get into why 
this is a mess. Um, this is the start of TTY struct. So every TTY device, character device, has one of these. One kref, which is the reference count of the object, there's an atomic variable in there. We have at least four mutexes. One of them emulate the old big kernel lock. Uh, one read white semaphore and one spin lock. I think we have enough. And it goes on. We have two AQs, two work structs. Um, and then there's two internal structures. Each of one has their own spin lock. And now I wish we could get rid of alpha. They're properly aligned <laughs> to get a 64-bit, not byte, bit write on alpha. And this gives you a hint as how well-tuned the TTY layer is. We're worried about writing 64 bits in, a, in an atomic way without using a lock. All these crazy locks that we have in these mutexes and the read-write semaphores, as, you, as I walk through and show you how the data flows to the kernel, um, pay attention. We use it in ways that are backwards. <laughs> these locks are like grabbed the wrong way. They're grabbed in fast ways. They're done with some weird atomic stores and some SMP buffer flushes. If anybody submitted this code today, everybody in this room would scream and say, no way. Um, but it works. Um, this is the big, I, we actually, I finally looked at this the other day before this talk. We kind of compressed it. It was, had a bunch of padding. So every TTY structure has, is at least 656 bytes big. Um, there's one hole that are still in there because of those padding for alpha. If we get rid of alpha, we can make it a little smaller. It's a big structure, but you don't, yeah, you do open a lot of TTYs and, and big servers and whatnot. It's a mess. It's crazy. All those locks add a complexity, and all those locks add non-determinism, which real-time really cares about. Real-time, as you know, is not about speed, but it's being deterministic. If I write a byte to that serial port, I want to know I will get, get a return, or it'll get out the other end in X number of milliseconds or microseconds or whatever. The TTY layer is not deterministic, and I'll show you all the reasons why. So this is why the real-time people hate it, and rightfully so. You shouldn't be doing real-time devices with TTY. I see people using real-time devices with USB to serial <laughs> over them controlling robots. That's even more insane because USB adds additional uncertain latency. USB to serial adds an additional latency, and it's just bizarre that it even works. Stay away from the TTY layer if you care about real-time. Then there's the driver. And the driver, you would think, for something small, we have 36 different function callbacks. That's a lot. You don't have to implement them all, but that's a lot. That gets an idea of how big and how messy this can be. It's very well documented. It's nicely done, which is good. But there's 36 function callbacks. And then there's a port. So every one of the TTYs you open up, you get a port. So kind of almost thinking of it as a serial port. They're almost one-to-one. -one. Sometimes they're not one-to-one, -one, but it works out. And inside that port, there's even more locks. So the TTY device has a whole bunch of locks. The port has a bunch of more locks, one reference count as well, more weight cues, three locks. I mean, come on. Um, you think we'd be able to consolidate some of these, but these are added there to make things faster. These locks only control and touch certain portions of the structure, so that means that data flowing through doesn't have to deadlock. makes things fast. And then there's the UART port, and the UART port is what a serial, the serial layer does. So think of this. I don't know why they weren't called just serial ports. We do now have a serial port structure, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, these are UART ports, and there's 27 of those callbacks, and only one spin lock, but then the, all the UARTs have a global spin lock. So if you ever start doing line speed changes or anything else for any serial port in the system, they all could potentially block. Uh, Real-time guys hate that, but we have to do that in order to control pro hardware properly. Sometimes multiple UART control, or one UART controller controls multiple devices on it. You have to block them all. Anyway, again, not deterministic. And then the USB serial driver, I originally wrote this, Johan, I think, oh, he was here last week, or earlier, he now maintains the stuff, I, a little smaller, only 38 function callbacks. Um, it's a mess, but there's a lot. These are complex beasts. You can get away with smaller ones, but they're there, for, because you read it. UARTs are not tiny little things. And then there's USB serial device. Again, I embed a, another TTY port in all those locks, and then there's another lock within that, and then there's a struct device which has locks and other reference counters within that. It's like turtles all the way down. There's so many locks here. Um, it's deep. So, um, let's talk about the data flowing through the kernel. That's a good idea. You shouldn't usually care, this is what you care about. So this is how the data will flow into the kernel from the like, user space, you want to write a device out the serial port, and let's talk about how the data comes from a serial port and gets to user space. Um, 
it's not obvious. I know many, many people ask about this all the time on the mailing list. I asked about this when I first started getting started with Linux. It's not intuitive. But in doing so, I'll show all the places in the kernel where the layer is not deterministic and why. And this is a fun thing. Um, let's not talk about the console. TT write write is op you open a device node, you write to it. Or consoles can do it. Or there's other ways within the kernel that can open other TTY devices um, because of pseudo terminals and other fun stuff. And then we, it isn't a normal traditional buffer, We're actually using iterators properly, um, make them a little faster. So we have the iterator. These are now how read and write callbacks in the kernel look like. They get a kernel IO CB, and you get an IO iter, um, IOV iterator, and then you iterate over the blocks inside there and suck them in and out. It works really fast. This came from the block layer. Um, they're now in all character devices. You don't have to do it in a character device, but I strongly recommend that you do. Um, it's more complex, and I'll, there's some hang-ups in certain places. Um, but it works well. So you don't see a traditional buffer. We'll find out how we get to that buffer. So inside, we finally get down in the kernel from that right to the real work. And we call iterator TTY right, and we grab a lock. And this TTY write lock is a big, heavy lock. And we do something really odd here. We first try it. Hey, did I get the lock? Yes. No. Oh, then let's try really, really hard to get this, and I'll sleep on this. Did that? And I might time out. There's some timeouts in here that's passed in as well. Did that really work? No. Then I'll fail. And then you, I say, go user space, restart this over again. But there's, that's two tries of a lock at the same time, one after another. Again, that's not very deterministic. The real-time guys are like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, it's messy. But it shows that we really try and grab the lock. We really don't. We really want to make user space a little bit easier, but then again, it has to handle restarts no matter what. Cool. Right lock. Then go back to the thing. We check the buffer that's given to us based on the iterator. And here's the first mess. If it's too small, we'll just allocate more um, because this is user space data. So that is very non deterministic. Imagine you're sending 10 bytes, 10 bytes, 10 bytes, 10 bytes, 1,000 bytes, 10 bytes, 10 bytes, 10 bytes. Well, the 1,000 bytes is like, oh, that was bigger than the last buffer I just saw, so I don't have enough room for that. Let's go call KV malloc and let's sleep, and let's spend some time, and I really want some data, so please give it to me. And then I'll, I'm going to, yeah, give it to me, and then I'll go free my old data. And then I'll KV free. I mean, that's even worse than normal, v, normal K free. This is a non-deterministic mess. This is not good from user space. If you want to start writing data and you want to be semi-deterministic, write the same byte size all the time. But that's not always under your control, because you're talking to devices, whatnot. Again, non-determinate message number one. We're going to try and count these. Um, then we pass the data down to the line discipline. And I'll talk more about that. We copy, copy from user space. Copy from user space can sleep on some architectures. It can fault. It can cause page faults. It can page stuff in and out. x86 is actually really good about this. doesn't do that. ARM64, I think, is better, hopefully better. It's pretty good. ARM32 does some weird stuff. x86-32 can do weird, weird stuff. Um, anyway, and then we keep on going. Let's talk about the iterator write. This is really fun. This has been there for about five years. <laughs> um, we think we got the iterator right and the logic right. And if we got all the data out of it, otherwise we're going to revert and say, oops, we didn't do all this stuff and push it back into the buffers. Um, nobody's ever caught this. It seems to work. I think we can remove the comment. Um, Al Vero, would be nice to get him to check this. I, it's pretty funny. I think Al wrote this comment, too. <laughs> um, I didn't look back in the history. And then, if you saw Thomas Gleixner's talk yesterday, um, if not, go look at it online. It talks all about the preemption model of the kernel, how things work properly. He calls out a pattern in the kernel as being very, very bad. This pattern. <laughs> We're in a loop. User space gave us some data. We tried to write it. And then, ostensibly, we don't want to sleep in the kernel. We want to make sure that other things can happen. So we call, hey, is anything happening? Is there a signal happening? Wonderful. If there is, then we get out of this thing. And then we're like, hey, should we be rescheduling or not? Yes, no, maybe. So let's try it. And this is a huge hack. Um, Thomas rightfully says we should not be doing this. Um, and he has plans to clean this up. But this is hugely non-deterministic. And it will let other processes become a little more deterministic. But the process that was doing this writing now just got interrupted and rescheduled, even though it had some more work to do. And it could have done that work, maybe, but other things happen. Very bad pattern. Serial port does this, or TTY layer does this. Anyway, then we're done. And then we keep on looping. 
we loop all the data that we that was sent to us, and if it's all past the line discipline, we're good. We'll return to user space, and we're happy. We'll unrelease some locks, and then we'll do something fun called update the time. We'll update the time on the device node, because in traditional Unix and the POSIX rules, if you write to a device node, the time stamp should be updated as the last access time or last modified time. Um, turns out that's a security hole, because if you can if you can watch the timestamps go through, remember your passwords, or your keyboard goes to a pseudo terminal device, TTY device. You can detect the data that's passed through T uh, the char node by looking at the access times based on the bits that are going through. It's crazy. It was an exploit a long time ago. So we don't do that anymore. And TTY uptight time actually, again, non deterministically, goes out and grabs the real time from the system. Um, some architectures, most 64-bit ones, are good. The time is just a variable and it runs away. Some embedded platforms, this is very expensive. And you've got to watch this out. Again, not deterministic. You're just wanting to write some serial bytes. Why are you hitting the time chip? This is why. Then we grab another lock, an independent lock. We iterate all over the, all the different T2I file descriptors that happen to be open. Again, not deterministic. You don't know how many are open, closed for the specific one. And then we change it all. But we do, we do a gradient of eight seconds. We took a guess a number of years ago when this security bug came up, figured out you can't really detect any real logic if you have an eight second window. So we do some fast bitmap math, which is actually, that's the fastest part. And then we release the spin lock. But again, not deterministic. Oh, I didn't even write that one down. So that's number two. Um, and then we unlock the TTY device. Everybody's happy. We go on. So let's talk about the line discipline. Because remember, this is the TTY device. Pass it on the line discipline. And for the line discipline, I'm going to talk about the normal one, the NTTY one. And this one, traditional, pretty easy. We're going to loop over all the data it was given to us. And then, since we're going to write some data, we call down read. We're going to write data, so we call read. Um, this is the first in a long line of use of a read-write semaphore backwards. Down read, it's really fast to grab a read-write semaphore as a reader. It's very slow to grab it as a writer. The TTY layer uses this semaphore in a very, very tricky way to grab reader locks in fast ways because we just know it's going to be safe. Very scary stuff. But then the thing, the, the line discipline, can do echoes. You can do echoes for different protocols and fun parts of that. So we'll process the echo characters. We don't know how many. Let's process them all. Again, non determining mass number uh, two should be three. Um, we don't know how many. So you're going to process a bunch of data even before you start sending your real data. Then we're going to add a wait queue. We're going to check the pending signals again. If any pending signals are there, we're going to abort. So the data never actually got down. Again, not very deterministic. Nice. And then there's something called output blocks in TTY layers. We're going to process all those as well. Not only the echo characters, let's process all the output blocks before we get to your real data. Again, on determinant that's number three, which is four. Um, still, we haven't got to our real data. Then finally, let's grab a lock. We had a read lock. Let's grab another lock, mutex lock. And then we'll call down to the TTY driver. And I'll talk about that a little more. Then we'll unlock our mutex, and then we'll up our read lock because we were writing data, we uploaded a read lock. Anyway, very tricky, very, uh, turns out to be pretty fast, but we got some locks. We got, we're two locks deep in the TTY layer, or one lock, or one lock deep in the TTY layer, two locks deep in the NTTY layer, and let's talk to our serial port. Oh, first off, we'll wake up the wait queue, and then we'll down read again, because why not? Jump back to the top of loop, and then we'll up read some other time later, remove the wait queue, and we're okay. Um, that handles our loop. The loop is written a little bit backwards just for speed. Um, it's very tricky, but it works. But again, these read-write read -write locks use backwards, mutexes, fun stuff. Let's talk about the CTY dryer. So just do the serial port, everything. We're all used to that. We grab another lock. <laughs> the UR port wants to grab another lock. And then, because we have a data in one buffer, let's copy it to another buffer. Um, but only a page size big, because we don't want to have too much memory saved in there. But so if they give us more than a page size, we have to do this multiple times. Great. Um, you think that we should coordinate these a little bit better. Turns out we don't really send a huge amount of data all at once. And I'll show you more on the read path. It's even worse. Um, but page size seems to work pretty well. That way we're not wasting a ton of space. And then we call down to the real chip UART send. 
after that. Okay, so we're one TTY lock, two n TTY locks deep, three locks deep here, mem copy some unknown time, and then we're send. And then in the UART, start tilling with the PM bits, because we don't want to go sleep, because we're actually going to talk to UART. So then we talk to our real chip down below that in the 8250 send, and then because we like it, we're going to tweak the PM flags again. PM flags luckily are re-entrant, so it's okay, but we tweak them again. It's not really locks, but it's messy, messing with things. And then the UART will go out and read the LSR from hardware. Reading from hardware takes, who knows, how long. We'll do it anyway. We need to know this data before we can actually start sending stuff. So that's a non-deterministic mess number, well, five. Um, some chips read it fast, because it's just port reads, it's in memory. Some go over DMA semi-fast, but you've got to wait for the DMA loop to happen. Some chips go over USB, and they have to come back along now. It's a mess. Again, non-determinate. We're just still trying to write our data. Haven't done it yet. And then we'll start writing our bytes to our data, our UART itself. Some UARTs, one byte at a time, we wait, we write in a s small loop. Some we set up a DMA buffer and post it all off, and it'll happen later, which is nicer. And some other ones. Yeah, yeah. The, the PM runtime git is, can be asynchronous, and so that also adds one more to your non-deterministic mess uh, counter. What, the, the PM flags? <laughs> the, the, no, the PM runtime git in the previous slide can also have asynchronous oh. callbacks, which adds one more level to your... Uh, oh, it does? Uh, yes. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it's even worse. So we're I, did, I didn't even catch that one. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, it's even worse than I think. Um, <laughs> great. Please interrupt me. I, could, I, I Lots of people know this better than I do. Um, this is where things finally get out to a UART. Fun part is, if you're like talking some UARTs, there's an internal buffer in the chip itself, and then it'll spool those out to the line and wh whatever. So we've had all these non-deterministic weights up to the chip weight, and then the chip can do whatever it wants to. It can sometimes do it, but we need to flush all the data out to it, so sometimes we sleep and wait till it gets all out there all at once. Again, very non-deterministic, and I'm not going to count these numbers anymore. It's deep. And then we unlock the UART part. Great, finally. And then we're done. Data's out. It's all to the device. Everybody's happy. Four or five blocks deep, X number of non-deterministic writes, before user space gets back that it had finished. So when you're a real-time device and you had a user space process that wants to write some data out to a UART, you can never guarantee when that process will return. That's not good. Real-time people don't like that, rightfully so. Um, don't do that. Don't mess with real-time in UARTs. Um, that goes against everything that we do in Embedded, but this is, this is the solution. Um, and I'll talk, there's a few more solutions at the end. So cool, that was right, that was the right path. That was the simple one. Um, let's twist the other way. So when the hardware gets the device, because it's interrupted, you come in at an unknown time, you have an interrupt, you have an ISR, you have a herb loop for USB, you got some other things happening. Um, the driver will call a function, that this, is, this shows the age here, we'll call, if you want to write just one character, called flip char or flip string, if you have a bunch of characters. Traditionally, we should all call flip string, because you have more than one byte. This goes back to the original T2Y layer, we had these things called flip buffers, where we were writing to one buffer, much like a flip buffer on a video screen. You write to one, and then you flip over, and then you, you can write to another one, you have two buffers happening at one time. We don't have that anymore, but the idea, the naming is still stuck. Someday we'll clean this up. Yerji, my uh, co-maintainer for the serial layer, and the TTY layer is going through and fixing up a number of these names and cleaning up good stuff. Maybe we'll get around to this one. Anyway, you push it in. And then you call something flip buffer push. So you write a bunch of data to something, and then you say, go do it. But you don't really know what happens here. So let's talk about what happens. So when you call insert flip, whatever, uh, they both go down to the same part. First thing you do is, do we have enough memory? No, let's allocate more. We could be in an interrupt context, so we cannot fail. We can sleep for forever, we can spin, we can do all sorts of fun things that we do not know. That's a huge non-deterministic mess. No driver checks to see if we fail. Um, and the max we can allocate is one megabyte. Luckily, we don't usually overflow. If we overflow, we don't care. That means there's no readers. But this is a bug that's in the kernel for the past 35 years, 30 years, and nobody's noticed. Um, so it must be okay. But it's kind of scary when you see this. We'll get bug reports from the 
from static analysis, people saying, you're not checking the memory allocation. I'm like, yeah, can you test it? They're like, no. Okay. Um, and then we loop. We copy all the data. But that allocation, think about that. That can sleep. And that's a huge non-deterministic amount of time. So if you're receiving data from hardware, that data getting into the kernel so that user space can access it is going to be delayed by some unknown amount of time that we can never guarantee. That's bad. You don't really want that. Anyway. Um, TTY buffer page is the biggest size. I think we're talking, it's bigger than a page. I don't remember what it is. Somebody can look that up. A couple megabytes. Um, it's a define that's been there for forever. And then we push. And here's where the magic really, really starts to happen. Um, if you ever read the driver locking model um, documentation, it references a whole bunch of functions that you should never call. That's one. <laughs> um, we start messing with cache lines, and we start messing with cache line buffers. And these fun things called SMB store release and a couple other ones, whatnot. This is all really, really black magic. It's perfect examples of things you should never do, but it works. So we call this, means we're flushing some cache lines, we're relying on somebody else who's actually looking at that store somewhere else to look at this. And we're Im really implementing a ring buffer. But we're implementing a ring buffer in a very hand-tuned, written way, because this was the first ring buffer in the kernel. It, wasn't, it was written way before the ring buffer logic is today. Ideally, one day we'll go back and make the ring buffer code um, use this, use the real in-kernel ring buffer code instead of this. Uh, I think, what, Stephen, how many ring buffers have you written? Four, three in the kernel? Three or four or five. Here's another one. Here's the original OG one. I'd never use this. But anyway, and then we'll wake up a work queue. So your interrupt message um, came in and wakes up a work queue because you don't want to do all the work in the interrupt context, but the data still needs to get the user space. So you wake up a work queue, and you can go back and whatnot. <laughs> we don't know how long. <laughs> the processor can, the scheduler can make us up. It's mine. Do something later. And in the work queue, let's grab a lock. Why not? One lock per port. So we kind of make it parallelized. But it looks a little better. And then we do, because locks aren't good enough, we do an atomic read. Why not? And then we call SMB load acquire twice. <laughs> make sure that cache line is really there. No, it's for looking at different variables. But it's really, really tricky. And then we call the line disciplines receive buffer function, which I'll talk about later. And then we do the thing Thomas says never to do. We'll reschedule. And then, if you had a big buffer, we need to push it all up there, but you could have slept some unknown amount of time, we're going to loop again. And then we're going to finally unlock. And this, again, is totally non-deterministic, because we had sleeping, we're waking up at some unknown point in time, we're going to do this, we could sleep again, and we're going to keep flushing all this data out. A nightmare. Actually works, but it's a nightmare. So in the line discipline, again, we're writing data, so let's grab a read lock. <laughs> the wrong way. Um, and because we know what we're doing to mesh with the other read locks, we will call SMB load acquire, which actually was tied to a load release somewhere else. Um, and then we'll finally copy it into our local buffer. And this local buffer actually is good. We allocate it ahead of time. We're not going to have to allocate it at runtime. Well, while the data is flowing through the system, it's good. We know here's the amount of data we're going to do. For once, non it's actually deterministic. We'll actually load release. Now, these load acquires and load releases um, different CPUs can take different amount of time. They can be longer, they can be shorter, depending on what's happening in the system. Again, not very deterministic, but we'll live with that. And then we'll wake up another wake queue, and then we'll up the read that we're doing the downward. Again, read locks. I'm, all my data, I'm going to show you, there's no, we never do a write lock on a read write lock. Write locks are on the other paths where you do configurations and whatnot. Magically, this all works. And then, the data's in the line discipline. So user space needs to get the data. So it'll call read on the TTY port. Hey, no locks for once. But we're only going to give you 64 bytes. And we'll put it on stack. <laughs> um, it wants to be fast. But if you're reading a lot of data from a serial port, you're guaranteed your fastest chunk you're ever going to get is 64 bytes. For some high-speed line transports, that's pretty slow. I'm amazed nobody's ever complained about this. Um, and then we'll call into line discipline read. And then we'll copy the data into user space buffer, which can fault, again, not deterministically. And then, because some people found some really, really interesting bugs and whatnot, and passwords are in this data, we will zero out the stack buffer. Um, 
That was a neat hack to cause the staff to do that. Um, people figured out how to read passwords out of a running kernel by looking at a specific point in memory. Um, ostensibly, if you're able to read kernel memory, you can do lots of other bad things. Um, this mem set is really free. Processors copy data, especially setting them to zero, really, really fast. We're only setting 64 bytes, cache line to line. It's fast. So we're like, ah, let's be nice. We'll just make this real fast. Boom. Um, and it took out a whole nasty bunch of exploits, which was kind of fun. But anyway, you'll see this. You'll kind of wonder what happens, because after this, we're done with that buffer, and we never use it again. This is why we do that. Um, so let's talk about the line disciplines read. Again, we're reading, so we call it read. We'll mess around with the S and the cache lines again. And then we'll mem copy from the flip buffer that we had before, that was our out local buffer, and we'll copy it into the stack buffer. But we can only copy 64 bytes, so it's a tinier chunk. And then we'll adjust some magic pointers for the ring buffer stuff. And then we'll call TTY audit at data. So the audit subsystem is this really big subsystem. If you look at some distro kernels that's enabled, you'll see all these auditing messages. It's a way they want to track all data that what happens in the system. One thing they audit is all TTY data. And all TTY data includes your passwords. Odd, but they want it. Anyway. And then they'll call up read sometime later, because it's a weird way we do a loop. And sometimes we'll re-enter this loop with the lock held, and we know it's held, so we're OK. And then we, anyway, it's a really interesting amount of spaghetti code to read if you're really bored and want to fall asleep. Um, let's talk about TTY add data, some more about that. It will allocate a buffer. <laughs> that can sleep. And it'll just sleep for forever until it gets the data, because it really, really, really wants to audit that data. We really want to do it. So it has a copy of this data. Let's allocate another buffer. And then we'll grab a lock. After we have the buffer, we'll copy it. And then we'll write out to the audit log. Um, so there's another copy, and there's another copy out to the write log. We're like three or four copies in, other allocations. And I am not have enough time to talk about how <laughs> that bad is. Um, that is hugely non-deterministic. You can do audit logs across networks. You can do audit logs all across the places to disks. The stack depth here is almost infinite, it feels like. Um, for embedded devices, and if you don't have to for government regulations, turn off auditing. It's just going to be, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, and then we unlock the lock. That was a lock that was held. So any other read that would come through for that line discipline blocked on that lock, which is not intuitively obvious. Other locks that are held, you can, we can nest them and it's okay. This lock actually makes the reading serialized. Um, which it kind of killed some throughput and killed some workloads. But again, audit must not be used that much. I don't really know. It's a hot, it's a hot lock. Anyway. And then the data goes to user space and 64 chunks, and we're done. So that was dump. Um, questions? <laughs> Let's talk about the details. All right, that was details. But that is a little glimpse into showing you all the nightmares that are involved. Why it's not deterministic. Why Thomas was right. Um, it's a mess. It's hugely complicated. It's extraordinarily flexible. It's very easy to write drivers for, but it's extraordinarily flexible. We can assign any device to any line discipline to any type of hardware and interact in multiple ways. We can call from within the kernel. We can call from sleeping context, non-sleeping context. We can have loopbacks with inside. We can have echo characters. We can have different line terminal um, protocols that can inject other data along the way and do checksums and bounding things up. It's extraordinarily flexible, and it's why Linux has succeeded, but it is crazy. Um, way, way many ways to sleep. And the last one seems to not really be very obvious to most people outside of probably this room. Uh, I want to spread the word. UARTs are a mess. They're complex, they're horrible beasts, and they're extraordinarily dumb. We have to write a lot of code to handle this stuff. Um, really simple UARTs are great. Really simple UARTs are rare. <laughs> um, and people keep, as I said earlier, people keep making new ones. Why do you keep making a new one all the time? I do not want to know. You have to come up with all the code. You have to do the 36 callbacks, make it all work. It's a mess. Please, please stop doing that. We got UARTs working. Don't add new ones. So that's the bad. The good, it's fast. It's very, very fast. We support everything. 
It's very, very flexible and why we have actually succeeded. So that's the bad and that's the good. But it doesn't really answer Thomas's question. What are we going to do? So how do we fix this? So with the real-time subsystem, the last remaining bits are the things that people who don't work with operating systems think are the simplest bits. Logging, print K, most complex piece of code in the kernel. You can print a message from anywhere in the kernel while you're, while you're oopsing, while you're crashing from interrupt concepts, from bottom half, from soft IRQ, from normal user space. Logging is hard. Tying that into the console subsystem, which is tied into the TTY subsystem, is an even bigger beast. It all works, and it's very good, but that's one of the last remaining non, hugely non-deterministic pieces of code in the kernel. Adding the patches to the real-time patch set to get this to work right is the final piece of the puzzle. And we talked about this last year at the uh, maintainer sun, or the plumbers conference, and um, Linux Weekly News is a great summary of it. We're starting to see the patches flow out today uh, on the mailing list. I accepted some other ones to isolate some UART locking into simple functions so that we can break the locks. We're going to like kind of smash through the console subsystem if we're oopsing and we're crashing and we want to do an NMI. We can also print K okay, from an NMI um, and fix the real-time problem. So the way real-time is going to do this is pretty much just to punch straight through the layer. And that's fine. I'm okay with that. You need the flexibility, but we also need to add additional flexibility to break it. It's kind of realistic. But anyway, that'll work. Never, never, ever call a UART or a TTY device from a non-real-time user space test. Or no, call it from a non-real-time. Don't call it from a real-time. Don't call it when you need determinism. Um, you're just playing with fire, especially if you are playing with lasers. <laughs> Lots of devices. We can do laser welding robots, right, at three meters a second for a de past decade. Um, don't do it through a serial port. <laughs> Do it through something that you know is deterministic, know is repeatable, know that will work. The serial sub TTY subsystem is not that beast. Don't do that. Um, so along those lines, also, don't enable auditing if you have to care about real time and throughput, because auditing adds a huge another layer of non-determinism, not only to the TTY layer, to all other ports, portions of the kernel. Um, if you look at, there are ways to disable auditing at runtime, but even if you disable auditing, those locks are still there. And a lot of those locks are still there, and a lot of the um, mem copies and the buffer allocations are there, but just when it gets down to a lower label, the auditing subsystem, it just returns quicker. Um, still, you just added some extra additional code paths, you blew through a few cache lines, and you're back. You need to go back. Again, every function call in the kernel now has additional overhead thanks to Spectre Meltdown, so watch out with that. And then the best way to <laughs> fix it is just don't use it. Um, why do you want to use the TTY layer? For an embedded device, you usually just want to get some data out for debugging, right? You want to see the print K messages. You want to see something nice and simple. Um, but you have to enable this 65K hunk of a monster on how to do this stuff. Um, Nicholas Petrie did a great job of trying to tame that beast and try and slim it down. I think he ended up with... Is it like 25K? I don't know. He got, it, he got it down, but about halfway with like no functionality. Um, Thomas has proposed a different way to do this, and I totally agree with him. He, does, he talks about it at the, at the talk a couple months back. Let's just have a new character device. Simple ring buffer. No line control. Just want to spit data out, spit data in. You can make it deterministic. You make it simple. You make it fast. Just do that for one type of device. Maybe we can plug in a few UARTs at the bottom if you really care, but once you start talking UARTs, you start doing line changes, then we're back to the mess we had before. But if you really want it, let's do something like this. Um, you can search for this file. It's not out there. I'm hoping somebody will actually send it. <laughs> um, if you care, and if you do want determinism in the TTY subsystem, and you just want some de debug data, or you want to talk to a device at a fixed line speed, well, not, I'm very willing to take patches to do that. Um, I tried to resuscitate Nicholas's patches. Um, they don't really work anymore. And he was trying to subvert it at a different level with no line disciplines and other like that. And that was, we think we should just not even worry about that at all. Thomas goes into more detail about it in his talk um, at that other conference from the LWN network, and I totally agree with him. I'll do that. And then Yerji has been cleaning up the TTY layer a lot. 
trying to make things a little simpler to use, um, we'll definitely start getting down to dropping a few of these locks. We have too many locks. We have still a big kernel lock in the TTY layer, one of those mutexes, one of those four that we use. Um, we need to start breaking that down a little bit more. Um, I don't think we can ever get rid of all the determinism just by virtue of the way and the flexibility we have to have, but we can get better and we're willing to take patches. There's a few people starting to do this work and I'm very happy to see this. So, best way to do it, just leave it alone. <laughs> Thank you. So these were the mascots from the kernel recipes. Um, maybe next year you guys can have, you guys will have a few branded one as well. Yeah. Uh, you said there were UARTs that had simple drivers. So uh, do you, can you promote those simple UART drivers and then like just have a list of line, like line count and uh, complexity of those drivers so that like you know, vendors know what to use in their upcoming silicone? Um. I can, I can do that, yeah. The problem is our, our 8250 driver has grown to be such a beast because we support everything in it and it's whatnot. And you can, we've talked about ways of, I think if you, we split it up in such ways that if you disable a whole bunch of options, they can get a lot tinier, but you still have a bunch of complexity in there. Um, there's not always, the biggest thing is you're not following the standard spec, so you do a little quirk. If you have to do a little quirk, you need another little function, you need a function callback. And a, just don't do any quirks. Just do a bog standard 8250 driver, please. Uh, so a follow-up to that would be, what's the, like, your ideal driver? Like, this is the template you should copy because it works so well. Um, I'll point at the USB layer. Uh, the USB layer did a really simple driver for USB serial to start with. It's a generic, it's called the generic USB serial driver. It can send data in, talk to the uh, USB port, send it back out. So then if you replace, you take that infrastructure and replace that, send the data out and receive the data and don't care about line speeds and line changes and whatnot, the logic there is very tiny and slim and I think we're down five, six K max. Um, and you can just replace that with a real chip on the other end. I'm hoping somebody would do that for a real, like the raw UART driver, make it something like that. But um, talk to me offline, yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I need to look that up. And how then you can put that on a board, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> how does SERDEV uh, fit into this? Does it also need all these layers or...? I'm sorry? SERDEV. There are, you can have uh, SERDEV devices and they bind directly to the serial port. And yeah, you can, like, you have a coprocessor or something. Do they also have to deal with all of their TTY locking and such? Yes. They do, but they go through, um, depends on where that hooking up happens. Is that through the SEER dev? Yeah, SEER dev, yeah. Um, layer, it, it does have its own line discipline. So it intercepts really early at the TTY layer, and it kind of does some loopbacks within the kernel. So Bluetooth uses, Bluetooth TTY uses that, another one. But you still have a lot of those line disciplines. Depends on what line discipline you assign to it. Well, it's kind of its own. Um, it's not as bad, but it's not perfect. It's not deterministic. Um, Rob's done a really good job to make it easy to use, not necessarily um, fast, because these line rates are pretty slow overall these days. Um, I can analyze that, but it's not, not that bad, but not that good. Sorry, I don't really have a good answer. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about this uh, write DMA path. So like, if you take a DD and pump it into def TTY S whatever, right, directly, um, there is a mem copy in that path before it hits the UART? There's like three mem copies. <laughs> so like, there is no chance to do high performance DMA into TTY S whatever? Um. I mean, if, if the like uh, TTY serial driver like picks up the buffers using a DMA, there will be a lot of mem copy before the DMA, right? Yeah. So the performance will just suck. The performance will suck um, to a point. The 
kernels copy data really, really fast. To do a DM, set up the set up for a DMA buffer and switch all that stuff and then enable a DMA engine is a very expensive rate. We do have UARTs that do DMA, and that's good for this stupid little end polling where we like character, character, character. We can do a big chunk, character, and then return, and we'll go on. And we know that the data is going to make it, right? Sometimes we look at it, but usually we just hope it, pray it gets there. That saves that portion of the CPU burn. It does not save your throughput. Um, but to be fair, even at line rates of really high baud rates, copy data is fast. But it is very non-deterministic. To set up a DMA buffer in user space and pass it down, I've never heard, I've never seen that request. And is that like the DMA is always picking a page of data? Or is the buffer somehow bigger uh, eventually? That's up to the driver. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know. There are, different drivers do it in different ways. You look at the, some of the drivers that are PCI cards that have multiple UARTs on them, and they talk some other protocol with DMA buffers and mailboxes and fun. They look like a SCSI device. Um, they do things in a different way than 8250 DMA does. But 8250 DMA is pretty standardized these days, so it's not that hard. It's actually split out to its own file, so you can look at it. But Thanks. All those mem copies happen first. Hello, thanks for your presentation. Uh, my question is, do you think that the POSIX uh, functions to configure the TTI was part of the problem with adding a lot of flexibility for legacy and unused features, or there is no relationship? Yeah, POSIX, well, POSIX just standardized the API in a way that everybody was already doing up to that. I mean, RMS is the guy who started POSIX. Um, so you can blame him for that. Um, but it was a good idea. So the flexibility of TTYs, I mean, TTYs have, again, been around since the early CPUs, I mean, early processors, multi. So you have to have a way to do job control and to do signal handling and to handle all these different types of hardwares. And POSIX rules require that. And it's good, because then we can have a console, and we can switch a console, and we can have a serial, we can have a, do our SSH, we can have do all these flip and all these other functionalities. This is good. This is good functionality that we need and want. Um, so, we've done it all, let's leave it alone, but if you want to circumvent it all, maybe we should also add something else. But um, POSIX rules are here to stay, we need to always support legacy stuff, uh, you really want to run those old binaries, you really want to run a BBS, all the stuff is still in use today. Uh, again, German tra train network runs on ISDN, which is over the serial layer. Um, we still need those requirements. So, it is complex, it is messy, but it's a non-trivial functionality. Pseudo TTYs and real TTYs. And we got to get, we trimmed out a few. We don't have the control node TTYs. I got rid of those about 20 years ago, finally. BSD still has those, but we got rid of those. And those might not be fully POSIX compliant, but nobody seemed to notice. So we're okay. Anybody else? Well, I'm right on time, and it's lunchtime. So thank you very much.